life? Eventually. Now I'm gonna, let me open my... Uh, we're talking about, and this is part three, this will be the last part. Uh, so we're going to have probably one more message uh, to end or conclude chapter 15. The last chapter of 1 Corinthians uh, is uh, chapter 16, so we're about finished. But this is the third in the se series of what happens when we die. And there is uh, a great deal of material teaching, straightforward and explanation type teaching in 1 Corinthians 15 about what happens when we die. And so we've been looking at that, and there's the, Paul says that, uh, and the, the Bible teaches, and Christian doctrine teaches, that there is an immaterial part of us, our spirit. We are a soul. We don't have a soul. We are a soul. But we have a body, a spirit, and that's what makes our soul. And so that is our life. But in the same way that our spirit in, in effect, at the time of conception, enters into our physical being. It also departs, and that's what happens, that's what death is. It's really the death of the physical body. It uh, is the demise of, the, uh, of the, the vessel that carries who we are. Uh, to some regard, people know us by our appearance, by what we look like, uh, our, our shape, our, the way our face looks. People recognize us. Uh, but we also, our, our, let's say we, I, I have always believed that uh, the part of us that is unsubstantial, immaterial, the, the spiritual part of us is important. If you understand this, or, or if you accept this the way the Bible teaches it, you see Jesus tells, told the woman at the well in John's Gospel, chapter 4, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit. Now, what the incarnation is, the Christmas story, is when God took on a human form. As a matter of fact, Jesus was given the name, which uh, was just a descriptor name. It wasn't a, a name that he was called, but he was described as Emmanuel, which means God with us. Paul in 2 chapter of Philippians tells us that Jesus and God, uh, that, that we describe it as the incarnation. It's when God became a human being. John's Gospel tells it most plainly. He says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, you and I, uh, I'm here with Danny and with Ronnie this morning, or they're with me, but we're not identical with each other. God is not a man. He's not a human being. But Jesus became a man. He became a baby. And, and so it is important to understand that our lives are a journey of connecting with the Spirit of God, but also working within the framework of, our, of what we want to taste, what we want to smell, see what we want to touch, what, how we want to feel. There's a struggle and there's a battle between the physical and the spiritual. Now, we do not go the route of the Gnostics who would just say anything physical is, is evil and wicked. Now, we do know that we're fallen when we're lost, that uh, when we're, we're fallen when we're born. We're born, born without God, and we, need, we, have, we have to be born, into the, born again into the family of God. But our journey is, sometimes we feel compelled to be more and more physical. And that's the, the, the route that so many take. What, what are, I want to taste everything. I want to see everything. I want to hear. And we, to have physical experiences, and uh, not all of those are bad. Many, many of them are joyous and wonderful. And, and God created our senses so that we could enjoy and have physical enjoyment. But it is wrong to allow our physicality to be what matters most in our lives because God is a spirit. We can't see God with our eyes, and so we might not believe in God. We can't hear the voice of God with our ears. We 
uh, our senses seem to be useless in connecting with God. Now there have been many, uh, there are many evidences of God. There have been many proofs of God, many uh, interactions of God with His creatures that people have seen, that they have experienced physically. They've had physical healing, miraculous things have happened before their eyes and in their ears. But those are things that, and I know that even in the world of faith and belief in religion, there are those who rely almost exclusively upon that. There's, that's the health, wealth, and wisdom gospel. The, the gospel that says you'll never be sick, you'll never be ill, you'll, you'll always have plenty of money, you, you, all of your prayers will be answered. Uh, your life will be wonderful and you won't have any problems as long as you uh, as long as you believe. Well, we find from the Bible teaching and also from experience that that is not God's intent. But we connect with him with through spiritual disciplines. We have to our, our spirit has to when, when Jesus said that we need to learn how to deny ourselves. He was talking, and one of the fruit of the aspects of the fruit of the Spirit is uh, self-control, or to be able to uh, bring ourselves into a, a union so that body and spirit are working together. That's what discipline is about. That's what growing is about, is to find the balance so that the part of me that has the ability to connect with God is not overshadowed or not hindered by my physicality to get beyond what I can feel or see or touch to believe more in just what I can see or experience all of this has a balance to it it's not one uh, great thing when Paul is talking here he says there is a part of us and he says eventually what God's plan is is to reunite us with a body. To reunite us with a body. He calls it a spirit of body. But here in chapter 15, starting with verse 50, we start on one of the last parts of the, le of the leg of the journey when Paul is talking about what happens to us when we die. Our body lies there and it's an empty shell. It's an empty vessel. It doesn't have life in it. It doesn't have light in it. It doesn't have... None of the things that characterize human existence are happening in a dead body. But we do believe that what departed, or what was Paul says in 2 Corinthians, pardon me, 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says, I'm now ready to be poured out. And he saw himself as being a container, but he says, I am ready to be poured out. When Paul died, the part of him that was he, the I part, the himself, the, his memories, his personality, his intellect, his emotions, his love, his thoughts, all of those things which are immaterial are still cohesive. They're still together. They're still a part of, they, they, they remain him even though they depart the body. As we read from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 last week, to be absent from the body, Paul says, is to be present with the Lord. When the body dies, that part of us goes, the Bible says, to be with Jesus for the believer. Here in verse 50, he says, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, we've got to go through a transition. We, we have to go through a change. You could say, well... Why doesn't God just reach down right now and take us to heaven? Because of the fall and because of uh, the choices that mankind made with their free will, it was a departure from God and from the plan of God. And so humanity at, at large is not on track on the plan of God. <laughs> We're on our plan. That's why we have to be converted. That's why we have to be regenerated. That's why we have to be reborn. That's why we have to go through a process of transition. And he says right now, because of what has happened to humanity that was not on God's plan, flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does the perishable inherit 
the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. Now, Paul believed that during his lifetime that Christ would come, his, his second coming, would, would, uh, he would appear in the skies, that Jesus had promised to return, and that he will. Paul says, there's a great possibility. Paul says, I believe that there's a possibility that all of us will not have to die. But all of us will have to be changed. Now that's the point that he's making right here. He says, I'm talking about what happens to you when you die. But he says, this is what happens to you when you die. Your, your body becomes inactive. All of its life force and its energy is gone. It turns, returns to dust. It becomes nothing. It perishes. Paul says, well, that doesn't have to happen. He says that if the, Jesus should return today, Paul believed that I, we wouldn't all sleep. In times past, I've put that verse of Scripture, I've printed it up on a little card, put it on the door to the nursery at church. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. <laughs> Seemed appropriate to me. And no, they don't all sleep, but yes, they are all changed. But he was saying, even if Jesus returns, I'm still going to have to go through the transition. What I am, if, if the trumpet were to sound right now, and Christ were to return and to gather up all of his people, my body is still going to have to go through a process of transition to become what, I, what God wants me to be for eternity. Paul's been trying to use the best words that he possibly can here to describe what that change will be like. It's a... Uh, unique too. Well, on the way here, I've been been thinking of this song. There's an old quartet song that uh, I don't know if uh, Ronnie and his uh, family ever sing. You ever sing uh, I'll Have a New Body? Have a New Body. Praise the Lord, I'll Have a New Life. And that's a song that, that's really trying to capture what Paul is teaching here. I'll have a new body. And it's not going to be this body that gets fixed. It's going to be replaced with something different. And it's the kind of body, Paul is trying to say here, it's the kind of body that it works in heaven. It, it, it is made for heaven. It is fit for heaven. This body is for, from, it's made of the earth down here. Now, the kind of thing he's talking about is beyond our comprehension. He calls it a spirit body. But he says even if we don't die, if Christ should return, we've still got to go through that process of change because that's the very last part of our salvation. The Bible talks about the three steps, or the three parts, or phases of salvation. And they are this. Salvation is to be saved, the first phase of salvation, is to be saved from the penalty of sin. When we're forgiven, our sin problem is dealt with. Our sins are forgiven. We're saved. We're born again. That's when you become a Christian. Part one. That's what happens when you no longer, well, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I say, that amazing grace does that. And then, day by day after that, for the rest of your human life or your physical life, is the process of sanctification. That's the second part of our salvation. It's when we are struggling and disciplined and challenged to overcome the power of sin. In other words, don't let sin, Paul says in Romans 6, don't let sin reign over you. Don't let it be your boss. Don't let sin control you. Sin should not have any more dominion over you, Paul says. And so salvation from the penalty of sin. Salvation daily, moment by moment, breath by breath, from the power of sin. Winning over temptation, growing and becoming strong. I see Christians every day, who are still giving in to temptation. They're still saying no to God on a regular basis. They're still infants in Christ. They're still battling and struggling with the devil. If the devil is still a big problem in your life, you should realize that he was defeated on the cross. 
He's done. The devil can't make you do anything. And if the devil is a presence or has a presence or an activity in your life, it's because Paul says, do not give place to the devil. If you're still wrestling with the devil, do you know that when Jesus started his public ministry and he went out in the wilderness, guess who showed up? It was the devil. And the devil did battle with Jesus. You know what happened to the devil next? He just kind of disappears. Now, some of his minions show up later on. Jesus just casts them out. He cast a bunch of the devil's dominions into a herd of swine. The first recorded act in biblical history of suicide. What? <laughs> Jesus didn't continue to wrestle with the devil and fight the devil for all his whole ministry. The devil came knocking on his door and Jesus whipped him. Hands down. Every time the devil... And so the devil has said, you know, this is a waste of time. Has the devil ever decided in your life that you're a waste of his time? If he hasn't, you're playing around. You're just fooling around. If you're, if you're still falling to the same old temptations, if you're still falling in the same potholes, why do you keep falling in the same ditch every day? Why do you keep banging your head against the same door frame every day. It's not scripture, but I like the old saying, saying it says, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. Shame on me if the devil keeps getting the upper hand on my life. If the devil's in your life, if he has a presence in your life, it's only because you've invited him in, you've led him there, you've given him an open door, you've made place for the devil. Sanctification means that we must grow to a place where the devil comes to us and decides that we are a waste of his time. We're just not going to do what he wants us to do. We're never going to cooperate with him. We're never going to get in league with him. We're never even going to listen to him. You know, the Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. If the devil has a place any place in your life, it's because you're not resisting him. Because if you resist the devil, he has to run away from you. He's defeated. He's beat. We've won the battle over the devil. Sanctification is the second phase. But then the Bible teaches, especially over in the book of Romans, Paul talks about glorification. Glorification is exactly what Paul's talking about here in 1 Corinthians 15. And that's when we're saved from the presence of sin. Salvation from the penalty of sin, daily sanctification, being saved from the power of sin. And then finally, ultimately, lastly, being saved from the presence of sin. And that's what he's talking about. We're not all asleep, but we'll all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. So he's saying, that spirit of that Christian that died, that spirit to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But one day Christ is going to return. He identifies it as beginning with the sounding of a trumpet. Dead bodies are going to be raised up. Bodies that have turned to dust. Bodies that were lost at sea, have scattered to the seven seas. Molecules scattered in explosions and destroyed in fires. Bodies that were disintegrated. Bodies of people who, who actually, there, there, nothing, there was nothing to bury. They were never found. Not everybody is wound up, you know, and there have been people limited in their ability to imagine and believe thought that if, if something happened, if your body was gone, then there's no resurrection, and you're never going to get to go to heaven. As a matter of fact, sometimes people thought if you cut somebody's head off, that Jesus couldn't raise them from the dead, or if you poked their eyes out, they had to stay dead and they couldn't rise up. There are even Christian factions today believe that if uh, the, any way the, the body is damaged, then it can't be resurrected. Nonsense. 
God made us from dust. He can gather us up from wherever we might be scattered. It's like someone was uh, someone would ask how he wanted to die, or, or would if he if he was going to die in an automobile accident or in an explosion, which would he prefer? He says, "Well, I think I'd rather die in an automobile in an accident." And I said, "Oh, well, all of this is an unpleasant subject, but why would you prefer that?" He says, "Well, uh, in a in an automobile accident, he says there you are, but in an explosion." Where are you? So you had a problem with that. That's not a problem with God at all. Those when Christ returns, Paul says this more specifically and clearly in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He says, they were worried about the dead there as well. He says, well, let me tell you what. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. He said, that's the first thing God's going to do. Those bodies are going to be regathered, reassembled. They're going to be put back together. It's going to be farther along from Star Trek than anybody ever even thought of. God can do it. He knows your DNA. He knows what you're made of. He knows every atom, every molecule. He knows where every piece and part of you belongs. You ever get an old puzzle out of the attic or out of the top of the closet and start putting it together and find out pieces are missing? That's never a problem with God. <laughs> He's going to put us back together. Or if we're all together, he's going to raise us up. He's bringing those spirits. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4 that he's bringing those departed loved ones. He's bringing all of their spirits, who they are. Those people who have died. And they're going to be reunited in the air. And then, Paul says, then we'll all be changed. He said, and then those who are, he says, alive and remain are going to be caught up together with them to meet him in the air. And so that's a part of our glorification. Everybody's going to wind up with a kind of supernatural, wonderful spirit body that G, like Jesus had himself after the resurrection. We will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying is, that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. You see, that was the problem with the Corinthians. They were afraid if they died before Jesus came back, then they were just out. They were gone. They were just non-existent. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. Thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, "That's the that's the key." been watching uh, John Malkovich has done a, his presentation of Hercule Poirot, the famous Belgian detective, Agatha Christie's been watching the ABC murders and this lunatic is killing people and so there's a new inspector in town it's not Inspector Jap anymore but it's a young fellow, fellow played by one of the characters from Harry Potter, he does a pretty good job He's trying to figure it out, and he says, what is the key? We've got to find out what the key is, and Hercule Poirot says, I'm the key. I'm the key. In this story, Jesus is the key. We can look at the story of Jesus told in the Gospels. This is what it's like to die. When I die, the same thing is going to happen to me that happened to Jesus. Now, Jesus Death, burial, and resurrection were all constricted into a three-day period. Our, we, we may be in heaven, our spirit may be in heaven a very long time while our body lies in the graveyard. But one day, we'll be, God's going to follow that model, the Christ model in our lives. Always give yourselves, he says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. You know, that's what the people begin to feel like. And you know, that's really the, the case uh, against what the rejection of, of the gospel. I sense it among people who don't have this hope. I've talked about this hope. If you don't think you're going to live after this, you don't think that things are going to get better after you die, that there's a better place, a better life. If you don't believe any of that, 
He says, you're going to lose. You're going to feel like everything you're doing is worthless. Everything I... You just read from the book of Ecclesiastes. So whatever, whatever I make, it's going to belong to somebody else after I'm gone. Whatever I did, everybody's going to forget about it. Whoever I was, nobody will even know who I was after I'm gone. Well, that's the belief of despair. What if what happens if I just die and I'm just gone? What's the point? When I was a teenager, well, there was a group called Kansas. Now I know all the Beatles' names, but I don't know all the band members' names of Kansas. They have some great music, and one of them is Dust in the Wind. And that's a kind of a gloomy song. All we are is dust in the wind. We're made of dust. And we're dust in the wind. And then one day we'll just all be blown away. We'll be gone. We're more than just dust in the wind. We're dust that God has formed into a human life. And it is His eternal spirit that gives us vitality and gives us immortality. <coughs> I believe this. I believe this because Jesus demonstrated it. He portrayed it. He acted it out. He says, watch. Watch this. And I did. I am. And I, I believe that. I believe that he's the greatest person who's ever lived upon the planet Earth. And I trust in what he did and what he said. Now, I was thinking today that there are people that have a great deal of respect for Jesus. And they might even revere him as a great prophet or a very famous historical figure. But let me tell you something. Here's the question. Who do you think Jesus is? There was a point at, in Jesus' ministry when he put that question to his followers. Who do, you, who do people say that I am? And then he drew the line and he says, who do you think I am? You know, you might think Jesus is a great teacher. Well, what did he teach? He taught that he was the immortal God, the creator of heaven and earth. Now, if that's what Jesus taught, and it's not true, he's a lunatic. He's insane. You can, can't say someone's a great teacher, and then everything that he said was insane. He said that he had existed since before Abraham was. He says that he will exist forevermore. He holds the keys of hell and death. He is the I am. He is the one who was and is and is to come and forevermore. That's what, if, is Jesus a great teacher? I believe he is. But you can't believe he's a teacher unless you believe that everything he taught was true. If you believe, oh, he's a great teacher, but everything he said was nuts. You can't, you can't go that route. Oh, he was a great man. Well, if he was a great man and a liar, then, you know, it, it doesn't hold together. Who do you think Jesus is? That's the question. Is he who he said he was? I believe that he is. I believe that he was and he is. I believe in Jesus. That's why I believe he was a great man, a great person, a, a noteworthy person in history. But a lot of people, they include him with Muhammad or Confucius, great sages and wise men. Well, uh, that is only true if you take into account what he said about who he was. Because if everything he said about himself or everything he said about God or everything he said about anything is flawed and faulty and uh, incorrect, then uh, he's not all that great. But I believe everything that he said is true. All right. Next Sunday, since we're beginning, we'll soon be beginning a new year, we're going to look at the very last verses again in 1 Corinthians 15 where he talks about the second coming of Christ. Paul believes without any doubt that Christ would return before he died. He was wrong. That doesn't mean what he believed about Jesus was wrong. It just, you know, Jesus never said, I'll be back before you die. As a matter of fact, there was a rumor we see in the last chapters of the Gospel of John. Some people spread a rumor that, that John, the apostle, would still be alive when Jesus returned. And then the writer says, I didn't say that. 
That's just what some people were saying. The Apostle John's been gone for a long, long time. Well, uh, I want to share with you what I believe the Bible teaches about the return of Christ, about the sounding of the trumpet. I believe that, yes, it could happen at any time now. But what does the Bible teach? The Bible doesn't say when. Paul and the other New Testament writers anticipated and longed for the return of Christ. Even John said, come Lord Jesus. But he hasn't yet. That doesn't mean that he's not going to. God bless you all. And I trust that you have a wonderful, happy, Merry Christmas on Friday. And that you have a blessed week. And uh, pray for each other. Stay in touch. Please, let me ask you, do something that allows you, that, that gives you the possibility of connecting with each other as a member of this church, as a member of the body of Christ here at Walnut Grove. Put forth the effort. I know that you're probably discouraged, and you wish we could just have normal church, and you wish things could be the way that they used to be. But do not give up on finding ways. Ask God to show you a way. Let the members of our church know that you think of them. Call them. Send them a card. Send a letter. Call them on the phone. Send them a text. But don't just be so filled with despair or with discouragement that you don't minister to others. If you do that, I heard... Dr. Adrian Rogers on the message today, on the way here, let me see if I can re remember it. It did stick with me. He was quoting Corey Ten Boom, a great sweet lady who was spent so long in the concentration camps in World War II. Corey Ten Boom, she survived. Corey Ten Boom said this, If you look around you, you'll become discouraged. If you look out, you'll be discouraged. He says, if you look within, you'll become depressed. But if you look to Jesus, you'll be victorious. I believe that people today are discouraged when they're, they're looking all around us. You, you, got, you can't put your focus on that. You just can't. That's not what's important. Sometimes they, i got to count on me. I got to look in here. I got to be reflective. I got to. I've got to uh, take a look and take a stock of self, and that's why so many people are struggling and battling with depression these days. Look to Jesus. Look up. That's where the victory is. God bless you all. Thank you for coming, Ronnie. We appreciate it. Danny. I appreciate you being here. Merry Christmas, everybody. And I'm selling a. Christmas tree ornaments. Just let me know how many you want. <laughs>